Hey, Freedom Family, so great to be with you. We have entered the Advent season. Any Christmas fans out there? Oh yeah, me too. Well, a lot of you know that I am a dad. Christmas is a lot of fun when you have kids. And also, I really like dad jokes. And so I got one for you. I love the fact that we have so many college students around our Freedom Family. You know, when I was in college, I was so broke, I couldn't even pay the electric bill. Those were some of the darkest days of my life. Well, one of the things I love about the Christmas accounts in the Bible is that they're messy, right? They connect with the really gritty reality that all of us deal with on a daily and weekly basis. They're human. They're honest. And because they're so honest, they can be a great source of hope for us. Now, as we look at the Christmas narratives over the next few weeks, we're going to continue to unpack this subject of fear. Now, it's striking how often the topic of fear shows up in these Christmas stories. And today, we're going to talk about the fear of disappointment. So let's jump in in Luke chapter 2. Luke, excuse me, Luke chapter 1. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. 
Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord God, we love you. We worship you, God. Father, I thank you that you are near to every one of us. Lord, when we feel it and when we don't feel it, you are near to us. And God, I thank you that you are working in our lives. Holy Spirit, will you fill us right now? Lord, I pray that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, hope is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Almost nothing happens without hope. Hope fuels the soul. Now, what do you feel like doing when you're depressed? Nothing, right? When we're depressed, we don't feel like doing anything. We don't want to get out of bed. We don't want to go to work. We don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to read a book. We don't want to do anything. You know, if you're watching a game, you can always tell when the players have lost hope, right? They start to slow down. Their body language changes. They're not chasing after the loose balls. They're not fighting for the extra yard. They just feel like it doesn't even matter anymore. You know, you can really see the effect of hope in children. So when our kids were younger, we would take these random trips to Target like all families do, and we would never buy them a toy or some other trinket when we went to Target. Even so, they knew that there was a toy section at Target, and just knowing that there was a toy section began to get them excited. In fact, even if they thought there's like one in a million chance that they would come home with something, that was enough to get the blood pumping. Now, on the other hand, have you ever watched a child who's got to go like clothes shopping with his mom? I mean, it's like they're lifeless. I'm tired. I'm hungry, my legs don't work anymore, I'm having mysterious pains, right? Hope makes all the difference in the world. Hope is so powerful. We all recognize this. But here's the challenge. Sometimes we're afraid to hope. Sometimes we're afraid to hope. See, hope is risky. When you choose to hope, you are opening up the possibility that you might experience disappointment. And disappointment is painful. It's painful. All of us have been stung by disappointment. Some of you know that a lot of my life has been wrapped around um, academic achievement. And I can remember applying to graduate schools. And I kept waiting for the good news to come as I put out these applications to all these schools. And all my top choices rejected me. In fact, I ended up going to my very last choice of graduate school. I kept waiting for the good news and it just never came. Maybe you've experienced a significant disappointment in a relationship. Maybe you reached out and tried to repair this relationship, but the other party just wasn't willing to do that. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. Maybe a parent bailed on you. Look, sometimes we wait for something for a really long time, and for one reason or another, it just never comes around to coming to pass. Now, that was the case with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had hoped for a child for years. Now, in the ancient world, having children was a really big deal. Now, today, we tend to value other things like our careers or personal freedom or just being comfortable. I mean, children are inconvenient, they're expensive, they're messy. And so a lot of people are like, mm, no thanks, right? I was talking to my dentist recently, 
and he was telling me that his daughter had just given birth to his second grandchild. And then he said, I hope she doesn't have any more. And I was like, what? Like, what grandparent has ever said that? You're going to lose your grandparent card, man. Like, what is going through your head? Now, things were really different in the ancient world. Having children was one of the highest goals in life in the ancient world. Here's how Psalm 127 puts it. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Look, children were a reward. Everybody wanted children. They were a sign of status and security. They were concrete expressions of the reality that your life was blessed by God. Now, given that background, how do you think Zechariah and Elizabeth felt when they couldn't have children? They were devastated. They were living a nightmare. This was the, probably the most defining feature in their lives. They probably had a million conversations about this. What's wrong with us? Why are we cursed? Did we violate the law of Moses in some way? Why won't God help us? Now that kind of disappointment has a significant effect on the soul, right? It destroys hope. It just starts to feel too painful to hope. We're afraid of being disappointed. Zechariah was so impacted by his experiences that when an angel of God appears to him and tells him he's going to have a son, Zechariah doesn't celebrate, he doesn't start crying, he doesn't start worshiping God. Instead, this is what he says, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now think about this for a moment. This dude is being talked to by an angel from God. The scripture says the experience is so startling that Zechariah is gripped with fear. And yet, the years of, the, of disappointment apparently have had a much greater impact on his life. So that in that moment, he just says, how can I be sure of this? How can I be sure of this? See, delays and disappointments can be crushing. We've got to learn how to process delays in a healthy way. Some of us go to some really bad places in our lives when we experience delays. Maybe we turn on ourselves and start to embrace some form of self-loathing. What's wrong with me? How come I can't ever get it right? Why do good things never happen to me? Now look, in the case of Elizabeth and Zechariah, they actually hadn't done anything wrong. Here's what Luke writes. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So we've got to be very careful about letting our delays shape our identity. Now, on the other hand, we might start to doubt God. God, where are you? Don't you even care? What are you doing, God? Why won't you help me? Now, look, that's a very normal response. But notice the first words the angel says to Zechariah. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Look, God hears our prayers. Now, here's a question. Do you think Zechariah was still praying for a child when the angel appeared to him? Highly unlikely, right? They were old. He probably hadn't prayed that prayer for years, and yet God had heard him all along. God hears our prayers, even when it feels like he's distant and he's not acting, he's not moving. He is listening to our prayers, Look, this delay was not an indication that God was distant or unconcerned. This is so important. We've got to see this. God hears our prayers. See, the scripture is filled with delays. All throughout the scriptures, we see this. God tells Abraham, Abraham, your children are going to be like the stars in the sky. All right, awesome, right? That's great news. And then it's decades before Sarah gives birth to Isaac. He's also told, Abraham, your descendants are going to inherit this land in about 400 years, right? Joseph gets this amazing dream about how his family is going to bow down to him. And then he spends years suffering. He's enslaved. He's in prison. What about David? David gets this amazing promise that he's going to be king of Israel. And then he spends his 20s running for his life, fleeing from Saul. Now, we could multiply these examples. Life is full of delays. Life is full of delays. 
And here's the obvious question that all of us ask. Why? Why do we so often experience delays in our lives? I want to explore this for just a moment. To begin with, we need to remember we are not the only people on the planet. We're not the only people on the planet. See, we love right now. Right now sounds really great to us. Right now sounds like the perfect time for God to do something in our lives. But we've got to remember he's also orchestrating things in the lives of a lot of other people at the same time. Now, God says something really interesting to Abram about the land of Canaan. Listen to what he says. You will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now, see, God is doing something in Abram's life, but he's also working among the Amorites. See, this is so important. God is working among them as well. He's not just going to force them out of the land until their actions deserve it. Now, again, this is so relevant for us. See, we think it's the perfect time for a promotion or a move or a new relationship or a baby. But look, all of those things impact the lives of other people as well. And just because we think the timing is great for us, we've got to remember we're not the only ones that God is working among. He's working out his plan in the lives of all of us. Now, let me give you some advice. Don't be emotionally absent in your present circumstances because you're waiting for something in the future. Don't be emotionally absent in your present circumstances because you're waiting for something in the future. Look, God's got things and people that he wants you to engage with right now. Life is way bigger than that thing that you're waiting for. Don't waste your waiting by doing nothing. Don't waste your waiting. Now, number two, sometimes God uses delays to test our hearts. Sometimes God uses delays to test our hearts. See, we all think we know ourselves. We're really self-aware people, right? Well, sometimes you'll be surprised about the things that will come out of you when you are in circumstances that you do not like. Now, maybe some great things come out. Maybe you're really persevering. Maybe you're courageous. Maybe you're patient. And maybe you're not, right? I mean, the circumstances that we don't want often show us things in our lives that we don't want to acknowledge. This is the reality. Moses told the Israelites, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. See, most of us hate tests, but we need tests to show us reality. We need tests to show us reality. Before getting married, I remember thinking, I'm gonna be an awesome husband. I mean, I'm likable, I'm funny, I'm smart. I mean, some woman's really gonna be blessed to be married to me. And then I got married. And I started to realize some other things about my life, like I am kinda of want things to go my way all the time. And I'm not always very gracious, and I don't always communicate very well, and sometimes I avoid conflict and all kinds of other unsavory things. My circumstances expose some realities in my heart that otherwise I would not have seen. Look, delays test our hearts. Do we really want God's will, or do we just want to be comfortable? What are you really living for? What's your life really all about? Delays help us see reality. Now, number three, God uses delays to bring about transformation. God uses delays to bring about transformation. See, God doesn't just test our hearts so he can expose us and reject us. He tests our hearts so he can produce something of substance on the inside of us. Moses tells the Israelites, the Lord humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God uses delays to bring about transformation. You know, when Joseph had this dream that all of his older brothers and even his parents were going to bow down to him, he was young, 
He was immature. He was arrogant. He was self-centered. Now, you can tell someone like that, hey, you need to grow up. But you know what? It's probably not going to work. It's probably not going to work. Fools don't listen to correction. They need to experience reality for themselves. If you're dealing with a fool in your life right now, and you think that telling him one more time is going to make a difference, you are not living in reality. Fools need to experience the fruit of their choices. Now, Joseph was young, and like most of us, a little foolish. And then he went through some brutal years in his life. Actually, most of it was unjust. But God used this to bring about transformation. Now, quick side note. If you are walking with somebody who's going through some really painful moments in their lives, it's not really helpful for you to keep reminding them how much character this is going to produce in them in the end. Look, just keep that to yourself. Just be present. Listen to them. Love them. Bear it with them. And let the experiences themselves bring about the character that God wants to produce. Now, number four, sometimes God causes a delay so that ultimately more people will see his glory. So that ultimately more people will see his glory. You know, Jesus healed a lot of sick people during his public ministry. But when his close friend Lazarus became sick and Jesus got the message, he didn't go to Lazarus right away. He stayed where he was. And then he told his disciples this, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory. It's for God's glory. A couple of days later, Lazarus died. And then he told his disciples, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now, when Jesus restored Lazarus to life, man, that news went viral. In fact, it started spreading so quickly that the Jewish leaders decided they didn't just need to kill Jesus. They actually needed to kill Lazarus because Lazarus's testimony was drawing so many other people to Jesus. Sometimes the delays that we think are so painful ultimately help a lot of people see the glory of God. They will help other people see the glory of God. Mark Batterson pastors a large church in the Washington, D.C. area. And actually, a lot of our Every Nation pastors, a few of them there, partner with Pastor Mark and to, to do some really great things in the city. And Pastor Mark says that the earliest memory he has in his life is being rushed to the hospital with an asthma attack. For decades, he has suffered with asthma. He wouldn't go anywhere without his inhaler with him. Well, a few years ago, during a Sunday sermon, Pastor Mark challenged his congregation to pray what he called the bravest prayer. Now, he said the bravest prayer is that prayer you've prayed what feels like a hundred times without ever getting an answer. It's hard to pray that prayer again, right? Because we're afraid of being disappointed. Well, that Sunday, after giving that message, he began to feel challenged by God to pray for his own healing again. Now, he had prayed for this so many times. He had dealt with this literally for over 40 years. But now here was God challenging him to pray this prayer one more time. So he did. Well, a week went by, and he didn't need his inhaler. That was highly unusual for him. Then another week went by. Then another week. After about 50 days, he started thinking to himself, I think God healed me. And so he tells his congregation. Then he went to the pulmonologist, had all kinds of tests done. All of his numbers were different. So he decided he was going to run the Chicago Marathon. Now, for someone who suffers from severe asthma, that is crazy. But he trained for the marathon and then ran the Chicago Marathon without ever once needing his inhaler because God healed him. Now, why did it take 40 years? Why? I don't know the answer to that question, but what I can tell you is that a lot more people experienced the glory of God because God healed him when he did than as opposed to when he was younger. Look, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing, and he will get the glory in the end. Number five, we need to consider the possibility that maybe we're the ones causing the delay. Sometimes we are the ones causing the delay. 
Shortly before his crucifixion, Jesus mourned over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. You know, sometimes God is ready to act on our behalf, but we're the problem. It's our own stubbornness that's causing the delay in our lives. Now, in these cases, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and say to him, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be done. Now, whatever the cause, delays are painful. They're a part of life, and they can be a source of great pain for all of us. So how do we hold on to hope? How do we take the risk to hope again when we're so afraid of being disappointed? Well, here's a great place to start. Find somebody in the older generation who still has light in their eyes and then get really close to them and start to listen. See, our culture is obsessed with youth, and because of that, so many times we're missing the wisdom of an older generation. Look, they've been through some things. They've experienced more life than we have, and they have some lessons that they can teach us. And so just for a couple of minutes, I want to take a look at a couple of people who were older in the scriptures, whom we're introduced to in these Christmas um, narratives, and their names are Simeon and Anna. We read about them in Luke chapter 2. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Now, Simeon and Anna, they were old. And through all the years, all the pain, all the waiting, all the delays, all the disappointment, they never gave up their devotion to the Lord. They never gave up their devotion to the Lord. Luke says that Simeon was righteous and devout, and Anna was spending her life in the temple, worshiping God, praying and fasting. And here's the lesson for us. It's hard to hold on to hope if you don't stay connected to God. It is so hard to hold on to hope if you don't stay connected to God. Look, God is the source of hope. He's the source of hope. He's the source of life. He's the one who has good things for us. He's the source of hope. And so we've got to continue to pray and continue to read the scriptures. We've got to get together with our brothers and sisters and worship God because God is the source of hope. Now, second, Simeon and Anna had a vision for their lives that went way beyond their lives. They had a vision for their lives that went way beyond their lives. Simeon, we are told, was waiting for Israel to be consoled. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, not just the fulfillment of some personal dream. And so in the temple courts, he sees Jesus, and he takes up Jesus into his arms, and he begins to praise God, saying, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. See, so often we have trouble holding on to hope because we give in to self-pity. Our world gets real small. We tuck in. We look only at our own lives, and hope just goes away. Look, your life is bigger than your life. You need a bigger mission. This is why you got to stay connected to the people of God. Life is a team sport. You were made for something bigger than your own life. Thirdly, Simeon and Anna stayed sensitive. They stayed sensitive. See, sometimes our disappointments can cause us to harden our hearts. We harden ourselves toward people, toward life, toward God. But Simeon and Anna, after so many years, they chose to stay sensitive. Luke tells us that Simeon was moved by the Spirit, and he went into the temple courts. After so many years, he was sensitive to the Spirit of God. He was listening, and so when God wanted to do something, he was ready to respond. When everybody else in the temple courts just saw one more young Jewish family dedicating a child, Anna saw the Lord's Messiah 
because she was sensitive. They were sensitive to what, was God, to what God was doing. Now look, do you know what helps? Do you know what helps us stay sensitive? Giving thanks to God. Giving thanks to God. Praising Him in the middle of your pain. Choosing to worship Him despite what's going on in you and around you. See, when we do that, our hearts stay soft. They stay sensitive. We need to recognize, even when we're waiting for something to come to pass, look, God is still moving. He's still working all around us. He still has areas he wants us to be involved. And so we gotta choose to stay sensitive to how God is working and moving, even in the midst of our waiting. Finally, Simeon and Anna held on to God's word. They held on to God's word. So we try to build our hope on so many different things. Our talent, our discipline, our appearance. Well, those are all great things, but you know what? They don't work so well when you're 84. Sometimes they don't work so great when you're 24, actually, right? We try to build our hope on these things, but we need a more sure foundation. We need to build our hope on the Word of God. This is why we gotta keep our hearts and our minds filled with the Word of God. An angel told Mary, no word from God will ever fail. It will never fail. Later on, Jesus told the people, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's faithfulness is the foundation of our hope. God's faithfulness is the foundation of our hope. Look, all of us experience disappointment in this life. All of us have known things that didn't work out how we hoped. All of us walk through delays, but God is calling us to hope again. He's at work. He's at work right now in us, through us, all around us. We've got to take the risk to hope again. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you that you see us God, you know we can be honest with you. We don't have to hide our disappointments from you. You know all of it. You already know how we feel. You know the painful things, the areas that where we felt let down, the things that didn't work out how we hoped or how we expected. And God, right now, we just take a moment to bring those things before you. God, we humble ourselves. Lord, we want to hope. We want to be a people of hope. We don't want our fear of disappointment to keep us from taking chances, to keep us from taking risks, to keep us from hoping again. Lord, I pray that you would freshly stir your word on the inside of us. God, that we would see you. We would see your faithfulness. And God, that you would move mightily in our midst. Just while we're in this moment of prayer, Maybe you're listening to this today and you're thinking, I need God. I need God. If that's you, I want to encourage you to take a simple step. To say, God, here I am. I need you. I want you in my life. Please forgive my sins. Lord, I put my hope in you. Father, I thank you that when we take that step, we have a hope that just doesn't just last for this life, it goes into the next life. That God, we have an eternal hope of experience, experiencing a day when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Lord God, when you will address every pain where there will be no more crying, no more suffering, thank you God that you have given us an eternal hope. Now Lord, empower us by your Holy Spirit to be a people of hope everywhere that we go. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends.
you're mighty to save. For you hear my cry as it echoes, you'll always answer, never forsake me. You